Good morning, Connections. It is Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. Glad you all could be here this morning. We've got some new uh, technical things going on. There we go. Um, glad you all could be here this morning and looking forward to starting my day with you and more importantly, getting our feet set so that we are prepared, whatever God brings our way, so that we accomplish great things for the kingdom today. Let's get started. My last uh, round of Undercover Pastor begins tomorrow evening, Wednesday evening, and well, not Wednesday evening, I'm sorry, Wednesday morning and Thursday morning. And after that, my focus will return solely to uh, getting us up and running multiple days uh, each week. So I'll be returning my attention to Connections and of course to Geek SI as well. But uh, before I notify the, the folks at the Kearney, uh, they put me on the schedule one more time. So looking forward to doing that. I'll be scheduled out at the Suburban. So come by and see me and we will uh, uh, start planning our pickup for May 24th. So uh, again, be out at the Suburban Wednesday and Thursday morning, and then that'll be the last time that I'm uh, doing that particular job. Uh, Dave, I believe, stands, uh, plans on staying on for a bit longer um, until you know, uh, the balance uh, doesn't work any longer. So. Uh, right now, he's got a pretty good balance between connections and working at the, the Kearney. So it uh, gives us an opportunity to be out there and see you all and gives Dave a blessing as well. So uh, let's get on with our Bible study. So yesterday, we I just wanted to... to tie all of these things in together uh, as far as God's feelings on grumbling and complaining. And we started where we're going to finish the week. We started in Philippians as part of the transition from Sunday's message into this in-depth look at God's feelings about grumbling and complaining. And we really need to go back to the very beginning to understand God's true feelings about grumbling and complaining and the dangers of grumbling and complaining. So that means going back into the Old Testament, in this case back into Numbers. Whenever we do that, we run the risk of people getting the wrong impression of God. Many people believe that there's a, a kind and loving and approachable God displayed in the New Testament and an angry and judgmental God in the Old Testament and have a difficult time marrying the two. Well, I understand. But if we go from the premise that God is love and everything that God demonstrates through Jesus, his love, his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, are the true attributes of God and we take those with us when we travel back to the Old Testament and start seeking a better understanding of why God would would enforce his boundaries so sternly it gives us a better perspective and the best explanation that I have arrived at for myself and for, for Dylan, who I, probably by age 10, 12, was asking the very same questions that many adults ask or want to ask and never do. And the best explanation that, that I was able to give my son was that God is a loving God. And we start with that premise and that he would never do anything to harm his creation or uh, anything that, that would be detrimental to us. 
and any actions that God took in the Old Testament was for us so that we would be given the opportunity to receive salvation here in 2020 and beyond and if he had not taken the actions that he took early on and recorded in the Old Testament those opportunities would have never come for us we witnessed in the earliest part of Genesis of man running amok and God having to to reset the entire human civilization by bringing a flood so we know how quickly we can can run amok and it is only through God's patience and guidance and forgiveness and mercy and all of the other attributes that we we tend to ascribe in the New Testament we see it work much even much greater ways in the Old Testament just to get us up and started so when we're talking about this in context with grumbling and complaining what we're going to look at today is God taking drastic measures against grumbling and complaining we should take you know that should catch our our attention that grumbling and complaining is toxic and it is the destroyer of of everything that God is trying to build and he takes drastic measures against grumbling and complaining in the Old Testament and we may say well why doesn't he take drastic measures here in in the church age and I don't have an explanation other than God is a God of grace and mercy and we are so close to the end that he is helping us patch things together so that we can can salvage and save as many as possible so I, I want you to have a proper context we're gonna spend a next few days in numbers exploring grumbling and complaining and looking at the drastic measures God takes to snuff it out and as we bring it back into our own lives we need to understand how toxic it is and how much danger it has for us and those around us so we're gonna start in number 16 right at the beginning and I'm going to introduce you to the backstory today of uh, the the greater story um, uh, over the next couple of days so this is the backstory if you will of what the initial offense was that then soon spread through all of, of the Israelites Korah the son of Izhar the son of Kohath the son of Levi and certain Reubenites, Dathan and Abram, son of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, became insolent, okay, disobedient, um, and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. So whenever we get a large group of people together, there's always going to be dissension. And people who believe that they can, can do a better job at leadership, they can do a better job of, of um, ministering to the people. And we witness that at the very beginning of, of God's plan for our salvation. That he has chosen Moses and Moses is has led the people um, millions of people across the wilderness towards the promised land and because of their lack of faith we know that they are turned away and are destined to spend a generation in the wilderness and not ever see the promised land until that generation has passed so a cantankerous unruly group of people that Moses is tasked with leading to the promised land 
we can reflect on that in our own lives and we've ever seen get together a group of 10, 12, 20 people and a lot of grumbling and complaining. A lot of, I could do it better. And we need to be careful because it's toxic. And that's what we're going to witness here in the earliest days in the Israelites as they are they're in the wilderness and they're looking for someone to blame and they decide that it's Moses and Aaron. So we're going to move ahead a little bit further to uh, Moses has gone back and forth in the interim and he's trying to, to get them to back down, trying to get them to see reason, trying to understand that they're not committing a sin against Moses, they're committing a sin against God and they're showing great disrespect to the plan that God has set in motion. So that's one thing that we need to pay attention to whenever we are, are bucking up against the authority that God has placed over us. We better be very certain that we are, in, we are not uh, only grumbling and complaining about that authority, but we're also showing great um, disobedience to God. So that's where we catch up with the story is, is Moses is, is trying to back them down, but it seems that the more that Moses tries to back them down, the more angry they become, the more certain they become that Moses is, is not the, the, the strong leader that they need. And so in 29, Moses says this, If these men die a natural death and suffer the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about something totally new and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them with everything that belongs to them and they go down alive into the realm of the dead, then you will know that these men have treated the Lord with contempt. Okay. So the time for, for, for talking it out has passed and God is prepared to pass judgment and now it is not about this group of 250 plus uh, dissension rebelling against the authority that God has placed over them uh, deciding that their way is better than Moses's way now it's not about them it's about containing the the toxin that has sprung from them that controlling it so that it doesn't spread into the, the, the millions of people that, that Moses is called to lead. And so he is going to use, God is going to use this group of 250 plus uh, dissenters to demonstrate that Moses is, is, is his man and grumbling and complaining is not to be tolerated for the sake of the Israelites and for the sake of you and I ever getting an opportunity to receive salvation. In 31, as soon as he finished saying all of this, the ground under them split apart and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their households and those associated with Korah together with their possessions. Dramatic, tragic, heart-wrenching, shocking that a man, that a, that a God of love and mercy and grace could be pushed to, to such a, an extent where judgment had to, to be employed. So we're going to continue in the next few days to look at was the grumbling and complaining contained? Or was there more actions that needed to be taken in order to keep the Israelites tracking on the right course? And again, a reminder, if the Israelites had failed at this early point, would we have been given the opportunity to receive salvation? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. 
We thank you, Lord, that you are a God of great love and mercy and forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, that you are not only concerned about the, the small groups of believers, but you are concerned about everyone who is ever going to be born on, to this earth and their opportunity to receive your gift of salvation. The dramatic course corrections that you had to make in the Old Testament, Lord, give us the understanding. Give us the understanding that, that these drastic measures were required, that you are the same God today that you ever were, Lord, and it's, it's, it's by your love, Lord, that when your hand is forced and when, when man becomes so insolent and disobedient that judgment is required, that's when we see your hand fall. Lord, we thank you for the grace that we live under, but we do not want to tempt you, Lord. We desire to see the door open to salvation for those who have not come into relationship for as long as possible, Lord, because we desire to see our neighbors receive salvation. Forgive them, Lord, for, for their trespass. Forgive them for their insolence and their disobedience, Lord. And give us time time to speak into their lives and time to, to, to see them come to the banquet. We love you, Lord. We are grateful, Lord, that you remain, that the door remained open long enough for us to receive salvation. We're grateful, Lord, that you continue to draw us into a deeper relationship. a little bit longer, Lord, for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Go out and make it a great day. Check yourself, check your heart. Every time that you want to grumble and complain, remember uh, Korah and the story that we, we just scratched the surface on, that God does not tolerate grumbling and complaining, and it is toxic. Love you. I'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great day. Be blessed.